<laughs> we did it. We did it. Yay. Better late than never. It's getting better. 150 shows later. <laughs> All right. Hey, good evening, everybody. And uh, welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach for February the 19th. Wow. Yay. Sunday Astronomy Show. Yay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, my turn. Uh, my name is Chris Kerwin. I'm the creator and admin of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm an amateur astronomer and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Hey! Hey! <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce our two regular co-hosts of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, uh, Mr. Paul Lowen from the beautiful uh, Moon Shadow Observatory in Hampton. Or the beautiful, beautiful. Moon, moon Shadow <laughs> Observatory in beautiful Hampton. How's that? It's well, beautiful. Uh, well, look. Okay. Beautiful. Biscetti. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, Paul. Yeah. Uh, and, our, and our other regular co-host here on the program, Mr. Mike Powell, from the Peelho <laughs> Observatory here in beautiful St. John. Welcome. Yay! Yay! <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody uh, on Facebook and YouTube. And thank you for joining us. Uh, first of all, uh, let's take a look at uh, what our topics are going to be tonight on in the tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Uh, hey. Ready? Uh, there, good, good stuff. Okay, on these uh, colder winter nights, especially the cloudy ones, it's a good idea to revisit your astronomy equipment to be sure it's functioning at its, at its best. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did, demonstrated how we should consider cleaning your optics. Now this week, we're going to take a look at how to perform a collimation. Uh, that's a technique used to align your optics so that they can provide the best views. Now, the procedure can be a, a bit intimidating at first, but hope the description will be useful to those of you who have reflector style telescopes and would like to give it a try. We're going to walk it through step by step here. Uh, also tonight, uh, Vinyl Bud is returning with another fine binocular target of the week. Paul will be presenting another interesting Rosanna's fun facts. We're going to have a little talk too about sun dogs. Uh, Paul's going to discuss that a bit. Um, <laughs> what are you guys on tonight anyway? On the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. There we go. <laughs> Duh. So are you. Um, yeah, me too. Lucky me. Um, I'll discuss our weekly stargazing targets and some recent space news that we've had, and uh, we'll have your, all of your wonderful photos submissions to share as well. Thank you. So this is a family-friendly, interactive live broadcast. So for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we are happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions in real time. These guys are happy to answer all of your astronomy questions in real time as well. And of course, we'd like to welcome back all those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support, Rogers. So let's get started then again uh, tonight, guys, with our program and a look at collimating a telescope. So um, maybe we should explain a little bit what collimating is. I was going to say, what let's is collimating? What is collimating? <laughs> yeah. So uh, Mike, you want to talk about that? Well, if you have a reflector style telescope or telescope with mirrors, then uh, usually it's two mirrors. It's a, there's a primary mirror and a secondary mirror. And you want to make sure that those mirrors are lined up. If they're not lined up, then when you look at a star or a planet, you may end up seeing this oblong shape. You're not going to see this perfectly crisp, crisp round star, or you won't, you know, you'll see edges around your planet that you don't want. So the purpose of collimation is to line those mirrors up perfectly so that when you put your eyepiece in, everything is crisp and clear, if that makes sense. It does. it does. All right. So if you have a, I could start right off the bat. If you have a simple reflector like I have here, my fancy Nancy. Let me see if I can give this a little tilt that way. There you go. Um, little fancy Nancy uh, ref, uh, reflector that I got from Skywatcher a long time ago, but it's a great little scope. And you'll notice there's a, a secondary mirror on the front here and a primary mirror way at the back here. And I went to look through it and found out, oh, it's out of collimation, okay? My stars are not pinpoint, they're all blocked. So I want to collimate this. Now, the easiest way to do it is, and it's worth its weight in gold, purchase yourself a laser collimator. All it is is, is basically a laser that turns on and it comes out. It'll reflect off your mirror, come back to this little circle in the middle, and you can use that to center your mirrors. Now, how do I do that? Well... You slide it into the eyepiece. Now, when you put it in, because sometimes your reflector scopes are not this small, you've got a Dobsonian that's pretty tall. 
You're not going to be running to the front to see if it's lined up, then running to the back. So on these collimating or lasers, it shows up here on the back, and you want to point that to the rear of your scope, so you can work from back here when you're when you're ready. The first thing you want to do once you stick it in is you look in and see where's that laser pointing. Now most mirrors, uh, there might be a circle in the center. If not, you could take a little black marker and put a dot in the center of your mirror, but you want to find out exactly where the center of your mirror is. On this one here, I'm lucky enough, I got a little, looks like a donut, those little, uh, you used to get them for your ring paper, you know, the sticker uh, paper donut things that you used to put over your ring holes to keep them strong. It kind of looks like that in the center of my mirror. Well, the first thing you want to do right off the bat after you get the laser turned on and in there and the and the hole on the uh, laser pointer, the uh, collimator facing the back, is there's usually... If you don't have what's called bobs knobs, if they're not replaced with knobs, there's usually either three screws in here, up here on the secondary mirror, or uh, in my case, they are little octagon uh, set screws. And what you do is you want to take each one, find a hole, stick your little, uh, if it's bobs knobs, you want to give it a little turn, but if it's not bobs knobs, you put in your Allen key. And usually if they don't have bobs knobs, the scope comes with an Allen key. And you give it a slight adjustment to the left or to the right and see which way your laser dot is going. Is it moving towards the center or is it moving away from the center? You want to keep moving it towards the center. So you give it a little bit of a turn, no more than maybe an eighth of a turn. Then you go to the second hole and you do the same thing. Just put it in there and give it ever so slight a turn. And it looks like my dot's getting closer and closer to the center. I'll go to the third one because I want to push it up a bit. And there we go, it's pushing up to the center. And now I got the dot dead center. When I look in, it, the dot from the laser is dead center on my mirror. That is the first step. That part is, is most necessary. Start at the beginning, start at the front, look down and set that laser in the center of your mirror first. Then you go to the back of your scope and if you had a dog, you just walk around to the back side. But you come to the back of the scope and usually there's six screws or six knobs or whatever uh, your particular scope has, three of them are for locking the mirror. So you just want to slightly turn those to unlock the mirror. You don't want to do them all the way out. Just want to just take the tension off them so that you can move the mirror. The other three are made so you can actually adjust your mirror. And if you look, you'll see the laser moving in that little round hole. You see that? Yeah, the red light down the corner. Yeah. What's that? The red light down in the corner. Yeah. So what you want to do then <laughs> is you want to take the laser dot and there's a little hole in the center here uh, or sometimes there's a target and you want to move the laser there until you can no longer see the bright point. It goes right in the hole like you got a hole in one. Now I know it's difficult with these cameras to see it but there it is. It's lined up dead center and the, the bright dot is completely gone out of my, my view. If I turn it just a bit, you might see it get brighter. See it there? Yeah. yeah. As I move it away and hide it back in the hole again, it hides in the hole and I am dead center now. So if I turn it around, I'm dead center here still. I'm dead center here. I'll just gently lock my mirror into place. Take one more look and make sure that I'm still centered in there. Centered in here, and you are now collimated. Your mirrors are perfectly lined up for a night of viewing, and that takes seconds to do. We get to the beach every time you put the, our dobs together because they're, you know, they they they're the truss dobs. So every time you put them together, the collimation is going to be off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, after you do it ten or fifteen times, it becomes second nature, and you can do it in a few seconds. Be collimated, and you're off to the races for the night. So yeah, that's as simple as it gets for. For collimating your mirrors on a reflector style telescope. Now, like when you put the collimator in there, when you started yeah. out, um, do you roll out the uh, the focuser to a certain point before you get no. started? Or? No, it, it doesn't matter. With the laser pointer, it doesn't matter. The focuser can be all the way out or all the way in. I found yeah. it doesn't matter to me. I, uh, my focuser is tight enough that when I move forward and back, it doesn't shift. Okay. I mean, you if it had shift, I would put it in the center, maybe halfway out and halfway in. Mm -hmm. But uh, where my focuser is tight and doesn't shift, I don't have that issue when I move it in and out. So, 
So if you focus, you did move a little bit back and forth. Would you want to have it like locked in the place first and then do your collimation? Because it would move a bit, right? Yeah, I'd set it about halfway, halfway out of my draw, put the laser in, turn it on, lock it right there, and that would mm -hmm. adjust at, at that half point. Okay. But for me, like I said, my, my focusers are tight, they don't move, so it doesn't make that much difference to me. If if you have a focuser that's loose, at that point, you might want to consider um, trying to tighten it up a bit. Oh, because, yeah. Because otherwise, your laser collimator won't be accurate. If, right. you got, if, if, you, if you have a draw tube that's not, that's just keeps moving around. If you do, rack it all the way in, do up your laser collimation, because at least you know you're at the that's top, of the, uh, at, the, at the plate that holds the draw tube, that's flat. And uh, do up your collimation, but then you know make sure that you tighten up that um, uh, that your draw tube because those draw tubes on, on cheaper scopes will come loose. Will move, yeah. But that, literally, that's all there is to it. There's not. It doesn't take much, and it's simple to do. And I'll tell you, if if you don't collimate your scope uh, when you get out, then you, your whole night of viewing is gone. You got to yeah. be able to, to, to collimate that. Those these lasers are. Worth a weight in gold to, to purchase one, or maybe thirty bucks tops. Yeah, and it makes now, all the difference in the world. There is a there is a point too that um, if you can't get a collimate that way, if it won't just won't collimate, there may be not maybe a, a situation where your collimate itself is out of alignment. Like it can, there are screws on some of them that adjust the actual beam, and um, from what I was told, you kind of roll it along a flat surface, have it yeah. kind of conceive. See if the circle kind of does this as you've got to point it, you know, along a wall kind of thing. And if it does, then you know your collimator itself is at a collimation, but that's very rare. Yeah. Uh, I've also got one that has O-rings that pop out on it. It's a Hotec brand. So when you set it into the eyepiece, you turn a dial and it twists in, and then it takes O-rings and pulls the O-rings apart. So that makes sure that it's centered when you yeah. start your adjustment. But that's just depending yeah. on the different costs of, of uh, collimators. Then you're collimating your collimator. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We're collimating a scope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you um, got to assume everything else is perfect, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> if you can get a couple of little C channels and just lay it there, a lot of people just take a piece of a uh, couple of pieces of wood and whittle yeah. out of these little C channels so it sits flat. Put mm -hmm. your collimator in it and just spin it. And roll it. Yeah. Yeah. And then as it's spinning, if it stays, if it doesn't start moving all around, then you're you should be pretty good pretty much on now yeah. kim's asking what watching on youtube but what is the name of the collimating tool, tube uh that is being used so this one i think uh, winston had one here uh from amazon uh sv sv boning so um that's another common name S V B O N Y. that's what this one is they make a lot of uh eyepieces now and uh parts accessories for for telescopes and they're uh, they're they're natively made for one and a quarter inch but yep. they have adapters that will um, adapt them up to a two inch. So if you've got a two inch focuser, uh, if you buy one of those collimators, it will have an adapter with it. Right. Or it should have. And it's, sure. very, it's very critical to have your, I mean, it, for a reflector, it's easy to do. Once you've done it a few times, like Mike said, when we set up uh, our telescopes, uh, got a trust, 12 inch trust dog, he's got the 10 inch. And every time you set it up, it's always different. Like you never get the, the, the trusses in exactly the right spot, right? So you, you end up collimating it every single time. The more often you do it, the easier it gets. It takes a couple of minutes yeah. more, more to make the adjustments on it. Now yeah. you're banging it around in the back of your vehicle or something, and, and normally you wouldn't have to collimate a reflector that often. Um, you know, it's just that if it gets bumped or, or banged around, you know, at all, uh, it, can, it can knock it up. So if you find that, you're, that you can't achieve focus at all, and that's uh, what's going on. Uh, who did a demonstration of a donut, collimating donut? Um, I was going to do that with the SCT. Okay. We'll show it with the SCT collimation. How's that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, then uh, let's do that. So um, with a with a Smith Cassegrain telescope, which is what a lot of people have, like this one you see here, and basically it's that. Let's see if I get that thing to spin here. So it's this kind of telescope that you see. It's either the most of them are Celestron or Mead or I'm not sure who else makes them, but there's a few others, I guess. But um, so this Smith Cassegrain telescope is what they call a compound telescope. And that just simply means that um, there are lenses and mirrors in this. 
the one that Mike just showed you, whether it be a, a, a Newtonian like he has, or a Dobsonian, which is just a big Newtonian, uh, you're dealing with mirrors only. With these, you're dealing with lenses and mirrors. These are actually a little simpler to collimate than what uh, Mike showed you. Uh, what you do with these ones is, before I get into this, um, I'm going to just share my screen and show you what you need to do to line up the optics. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I think it's this one here. Uh, let me take you off the presenter view here too, speaker. Okay. Now you should be able to go. Okay. So let me know if you can see, um, yeah. see my screen. Good. Okay. So basically, so with collimation for smith cassegrain it's kind of like um, it's kind of like having a donut, and and you want a perfect donut. So if you find that when you um, take your telescope and you put you rack it right out of focus, so you you find a, a semi bright star somewhere high in the sky, the higher up the better because the less turbulence you have to deal with, the less seeing issues you have to deal with, then the steadier is going to be for you to actually collimate your scope. And, uh, and you're going to do this live. So you can do it with either an eyepiece or you can do it with a DSLR camera if you want to. And uh, if you're going to do any imaging, then typically you'll have your camera hooked up anyway. So you put your camera on live view and then you find yourself a star. You take your um, focuser and you rack, you put the star dead center on your, on your camera. Take your camera, put it up to 10 times magnification or even five times, it doesn't matter, so long as it's big. Then you're going to rack your focus out of focus so that that star is just blowing up bigger and bigger and bigger. So when you look into your eyepiece or your camera screen, you're going to see this big circle and you're going to see this black circle in the middle. That black circle is your central obstruction. That's actually your secondary mirror. In the case of this one, this is not perfectly lined. So the big white circle you're seeing represents um, the big mirror in the back, your, your huge mirror that's in the back of your scope. And the little thing that you're seeing is the secondary mirror in the front. So the whole idea here is to get that hole, that donut, perfectly concentric. So that's dead center. So I don't know. And so the first thing you're doing is you're going to kind of figure it, OK, if I'm going to adjust the screw, there's going to be three of them. There'll be one, say, here one here and one here. I'll show you that on mine in a minute. So what you do to figure that out is just lay your finger, don't touch the lens, but just lay your finger across the lens, point towards your mirror, and that'll tell you where you're actually getting close. In other words, your, your circle um, donut is closer on this side. So it just kind of gives you an idea with your finger what screw to adjust, because you want to figure out, okay, I want to push this thing out. Where's the screw? Because the mirror's um, the way that they're bouncing uh, um, images back and forth, you, you might be pointing with one thing on your finger, but it might be the other part of the mirror just because of the, of the reflex, the way the mirrors reflect. So, so if you just take your hand or a screwdriver or something that you just put straight across, you can see the closest point that you want to actually push back toward the center. Once you've played with the three screws, and I'll show you that in a second, once it's perfectly collimated, it's going to look like this. You're going to have your perfectly concentric circle dead center. Then that means now that just like what Mike showed you, now that when you're looking at stars and, and uh, planets, you're not going to get these color aberrations and these arrow looking things. It'll be nice and clear and crisp. So that's what I want to show you what the what the um, what the goal is. Now I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to show you my scope itself. Can you put me on sure. uh, screen, Chris, whatever? Uh so that black thing that you were seeing is this portion of the telescope right here. In a lot of telescopes, you're going to have either three, uh, usually they're Phillips screws in the front, or in this case, uh, Mike mentioned Bob's knobs, and that's what these are. What the Bob's knobs are, instead of you having to put a screwdriver to the front of your telescope and around your glass, a lot of people get nervous with that, and it's a pain in the bum to try to actually turn it. Um, you take the screws out and you put in these knobs and all they are, they're just big knobs uh, with, that has the screws in them, but you turn them with your thumb and your fingers rather than trying to use a screwdriver. Just makes the job a lot easier. I'm going to take the center of this mirror out of my telescope because I want to show you exactly what it is that you're going to be adjusting and why we adjust why, the way we adjust. So that's the secondary mirror here. 
that I just took out of my telescope. The three screws that you see there are the adjustment screws, which are the same thing Mike had on his secondary mirror. The whole idea behind those three screws is this, this my telescope was pretty much collimated. So you can see that the mirror itself is very flat in relation to the, uh, the mirror holder that's on the bottom where I adjust the knobs. If my collimation was out, chances are I would see a tilt on this mirror, which means there's no way that's gonna line up with my mirror in the back. So the job of these three screws, as you can see, if you look right through this, see if that's something I can put, use as a pointer. If you look right through it, you can see those little bolts that are right there. So when you adjust this, you're actually pushing these bolts back and forth, which tilts the mirror back and forth. So if you're gonna loosen one, go to the opposite side and just tighten one, just slightly. And, uh, and because you don't want the thing to start flopping on you, because if it does, it'll go way out and it'll be kind of hard to deal with. So just like Mike said, very small twists and turns and keep an eye on that black circle we talked about before. And you make that adjustment, then you recenter your scope on the star. Always recenter when you're doing a Smith Cassegrain. If you try to do it off to the side, you're not getting accurate collimation. It has to be center. So recenter your star and then have a look. Did my circle get closer to the center or did it move away? If it moved away, then reverse what you just did and then try another screw. And then uh, so you're going to try the screw, recenter back on that same star. And did my circle get closer to the center? If it did, okay, I'm, a, I'm now in the right direction. When you're done, by the time you're done, this mirror will be flat like you see mine. That's the whole point of what we're doing here. And that's the secondary mirror, which just basically on this telescope just sits in the front, which all Smith Cassegrains are the same. And, uh, and it mounts onto your corrector plate. So uh, I'm just going to put this mirror back in before I get a whole lot of dust or spit on it. There, it's so sick here. There we go. So that's basically the secondary mirror, and that is what you're adjusting. Now on the back of the scope, and by the way, not all mirrors will unscrew like that. <laughs> I'm going to say, if it's not a hyperstar, don't take your mirror out. <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you on the back what you're going to be actually be doing. Um, see if I can spin this right around. So on the back, you're going to have the best thing I found to use that's really easy is to use a DSLR if you have one. And then all you're going to do is you're just going to turn on your camera. You're going to see that, that star that's in there. You're going to focus on the star. It's going to show up in your, uh, on your camera screen. And then you, it's really simple. You just make the adjustments. You can, because Smith Cassegrains are so short, you can actually reach around to the front, make the adjustment, grab your hand pad, recenter your star, and then have a look. You can even turn your, if you've got one of these flip um, uh, screens on your camera, it's perfect. Because you can sit here, I'm looking straight at the, at the mirror, that, or at the um, screen. I can have my hands making the adjustment, and I have my hand controller, and I just recenter my star. Oh, okay, that looks, I need, and just go ahead and make your adjustments. Really, it's just that simple. As, as complicated as these things tend to make us feel, and as scared as we are to adjust them, Basically, what I showed you is all you're doing. You're taking a mirror and you're just basically tilting it so that it is lined up with the with the primary mirror, which is the big one on the back. You do not adjust on a Smith Cassegrain this mirror. This one you leave alone. It's the, only the front one that you have to adjust. And yeah. that's it. what about an artificial star, Paul? Uh, oh yes, uh, artificial. I have one actually. So what artificial stars are? There, it's a little. All it is is a flashlight. And they take this big old piece of tin foil and they uh, poke five holes in it. And each one uh, represents what a star size would look like in your telescope if you were looking at it through, uh, through, um, uh, through an eyepiece. So you have to have these, depending on the focal length of your telescope, these things have to be a certain distance away from your telescope to represent what a star would look like. And it's pretty easy to figure out. You just go, you can do this in the daytime, do it in a shady area. And um, and put your uh, uh, one of these things on a tripod, just you know, electrical tape it to the top of a tripod. You know, put it say 20 feet or 50 feet away from whatever you need to get focus from your telescope, 
and then you just turn it on and then all of these stars will be lit up. Just choose any one of the stars or, or the lights and it'll look like stars. It'll give you that same pinpoint as if you're putting it in the sky. The beauty of this is you don't have to find a star. <laughs> it, it's always right there. It's pretty easy. And you can do it in the daytime to save, you know, your valuable observing time for the night. And that's going to check your collimation basically, right? And yeah, and all that is, is, is just so you can, you can do up your collimation. That's what that's for. Okay. Yep. So we have another question here. Uh, Kevin says, hey guys, on the Newtonian primary, how exactly, quote, exactly, do you mark the center of the mirror? Uh, tape measure? Ruler? Seems to be a very imprecise hit or miss kind of operation. So, you want to answer that, Mike? How would you, how would you center mark your mirror, Mike? That's what I've done. I put a ruler across if it's a six inch mirror and I went three inches. And you, you know, you, you know where you're going to be close to the center. I mean, uh, if you're off just a smidge, it's not going to make a, a huge difference. But that's how I found the center of one of my mirrors that did not have a circle on it. And that's what I used to put a circle on was one of those paper reinforcers that you used to get for your three ring sheets. Yeah. 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 And uh, all I did was basically measure across and put a dot and measure across and put a dot. And then I just put that ring around it. And uh, that gives me my spot. Yeah. Okay. And it's it's precise, but it's not precise. It doesn't need to be exactly it. I mean, you can be off a couple of millimeters, I think. You'll find oh, yeah, that they, most most mirrors have a dot on it. It's most yeah. do. Just and a if they don't, stuff that might not. And if they don't, you'd be pretty close. You won't be off by uh, probably a couple of millimeters. You'd be within a millimeter. I'll guarantee it if yeah. you measure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kurt says, Kevin, cut a circle of paper to the size of the mirror, fold it twice carefully, and snip off a bit of the point at the point. There you go, geometry at its finest. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. My old way was a hammer and nail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, works too. Every once in a while, it's okay. Yeah. Um, Josh is saying, what happens if you loosen the central screw on the secondary mirror of a Newtonian? Okay. So what happens, well, you, you want to take a mic, sorry? Well, it, usually that's the one that holds it on. I mean, it, it's the, literally the piece that's holding your secondary mirror on. You loosen it and... Pull over it, just a bit. What's that? Can't quite see you. Bring it over just a bit more. Well, oh, here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, the one in the center. That, uh, normally what it, what that's for, what it, if you loosen that, your, your mirror is going to spin. Right? The three holes... And flip. Yeah, it'll flop and spin. The, the three screws that are in there to, to, to set the collimation are actually set against it. They're putting a little bit of pressure on it. If you loosen it off, sometimes these mirrors get twisted. You can loosen it and spin that mirror back straight again. And or it's just gonna, it'll rattle a little bit. Now you've set it off the three screws that are holding your, your, your mirror in, in its place for collimation. You really should never have to touch that center one unless your mirror has been tilted somehow. And yes, they have. I've had, you know, things roll into it in the, in the trailer and, and hit it and looked at it and went, oh, that spun right around. <laughs> but, uh, and of course, I've, I've done it myself, taken it apart just to see how it worked. So, but, or, or even just to replace the mirror. But uh, as far as that goes, just uh, if it's loose, tighten it up with your mirror straight, get your mirror lined back up with your eyepiece hole again, and then you'll have to go through recollimation again. You turn one screw a half a turn out, you want to turn the other one half a turn in, right? Basically. I, I go less than that. It's like an eighth of a turn on each of the each of the three. If there's sometimes they're set screws, sometimes they're Allen key screws, and or if you're lucky enough, they have bobs knobs mm -hmm. for the three. And the one in the center, basically, that that's just there it, that holds your mirror. That's the main piece the screw to hold your mirror on, but it also snugs it up against those three, right? right. So that's yeah. a single point of access. And then when you hit either of those three, it's tilting your mirror slightly, you know, like that. And that's why when you call a mate, you're trying to get that centered back up again. So it's perfectly straight. Like Paul says, you can look at it and be level at the bottom and level on the mirror kind of thing. So if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Does. Any more questions? Anybody here? We'll just, so uh... For the most part, like you just don't touch that one. Hmm. Try not to. <laughs> Unless you're like Mike who likes to tinker. Take it apart and see how it works. Yeah. <laughs> then go, oops, and buy another scope. <laughs> <laughs> Always a good reason. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, 
that covered that pretty good, I guess. No other questions. I don't see any more on, on either. Uh, so I just used a street light to call my nine and a quarter and I have perfect circles. Well, that's, that's about all you get out there tonight, Winston. Good job. I was going to say, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, street light will work, I guess, yeah. Share your images of street lights, how you stack them up and <laughs> <laughs> a really nice clear street light. <laughs> that's all we're getting to shoot these days. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's uh, we covered that. I guess pretty good. Any other questions? If you have any questions, just drop them off to the to uh, the site here at the page, and uh, we'll get we'll get to them before the end of the show. I just want to mention that there's tons of YouTube stuff mm. on collimation. So whatever your telescope is, make sure you look at that, and then uh, go online if you're if you're if you want to see it done. There's a, a, like I say, there's a million videos. A uh, Star Arizona is uh, is a good reference page for just about anything. And uh, but they've got really good that the, the stuff I was showing tonight was from the Star Arizona uh, website. Yep. So. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, Mike. Awesome. OK, uh, how about we talk a little bit about some dogs, Mr. Oh. All right. <laughs> Let me find me dogs. Just bear with me like get all that stuff back. There we are. That it? Yeah, this is it. Yes, happy family okay. day to all those people who are taking tomorrow as well. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, now, I was going to show that picture, wasn't I? But I guess I better find that first. Well, Paul's looking for the picture. I'll give a quick shout out to my nephew, Joey, who seems to be watching tonight. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? Hey, Joey. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and my brother, Danny, that tunes in every week as well. Oh, hey, uh, hi, Dan. Hey, Dan. <laughs> Oh, there it is right there. So I just shrink that down and I could probably show up there on my, uh, if I can find it. Uh oh, uh -oh. everything's froze up. Your dog running away? My dogs are acting up. Hot Gotta put it on a leash. Hot diggity dog. There we go. <laughs> I'm gonna put this back over here and then I'll now I'll try to share my screen. And right here. So first thing I want to show you is there you go. Uh, yeah, can you see that screen okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So Very these nice. are um, the things that you're looking at on both sides of the sun in uh, when you see them in this formation are what's called sun dogs. And uh, what they are, just one sec here, I just wanna pull this over so I can, can I do that? No, I probably just lost my page about you. Just bear with me for a sec here. Go to find things. There we go. Okay. So what are sun dogs and how do they form? So a sun dog is basically it is a con con concentrated patch of sunlight that is occasionally seen to the right or the left of the sun uh, or even on both sides, like you see in this particular example. By the way, I shot that tonight. Uh, this time of year, uh, this was the second night in a row we had sun dogs. Last night, somebody caught an amazing sun pillar from this very location. This is up in Hampton, by the way. Um, so, yeah, so these things are, uh, are really, really, uh, you see them fairly often, but they, they has to be certain conditions in order for them to appear. So basically, so like I say, they're, they're a concentrated patch of sunlight um, that, um, that is on the left or right or both sides of the sky simultaneously. And they're also called mock suns or uh, perhelia, meaning with the sun. And according to Washington, the National Weather Service, sun dogs are part of a family of atmospheric optical illusions, including moon halos. So we've all seen the halos. I think Mike saw one today or yesterday, today? That was one around the sun, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so they're part of that family. And they're, and they're also closely related to sun halos. And all of these phenomena are caused by refraction of sunlight uh, by ice crystals in the atmosphere. Now, um, I'm not going to get into a whole lot about this because we could do a whole talk on sun dogs, but um, excuse me. So, so you take those two refraction, the, the two refractions that causes the sunlight to deviate by at least 22 degrees, depending on the angle at which it entered the ice crystals. So according to the science atmospheric optics, this causes the left, the light rather, to ring 
uh, the sun at a distance of 22 degrees as sun halos. So they are 22 degrees uh, from there on, and they're even. You'll always see that if you see two of them, they're the same distance apart. And this causes the light ring this, uh, at the same distance. And when the light is co concentrated as spots next to the sun halo, again, they're separated by 22 degrees as appears. So suitably the phenomenon with a canine inspired moniker, sun dogs can often appear with tails of light stretching out of them. So in other words, a lot of the times you'll actually see little tails going off to the back, almost like you see on this one, a little bit of it right there when those tails are dragging in behind. Um, and so, and that's basically where the stretch is out. So these tails are created by the reflection of the light from the vertical sides of the flat hexagonal ice crystals. So that's basically um, a very, very abbreviated um, uh, 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 explanation as to what, uh, what sun dogs are. And so if you ever see these, that's basically what you're seeing. Or if you see a, a big sun halo or a moon halo, these things are all basically from the same uh, family of uh, phenomena. And sun dogs, so there you are. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Beautiful shot, too, man. Yeah, Beautiful nice shot. shot. Oh, thanks. Okay. Um, maybe we'll go with, uh, we can go with what's up again, maybe next, if you want. What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right, let me share our screen here. Uh, that? And I'll have to do a slideshow from the beginning. Place to start. And there we go. Up, let's do a spot. Oh. Settings. There, how's that? Yep, yep. Right. Okay, a uh, little bit of talk about what's coming up this week. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot. Uh, listed as far as celestial events go, except for the fact that the moon's back in our sky. So it's going to be mostly about the moon uh, this week and a little bit of space news to follow up afterwards. Uh, okay, first of all, though, I'd like to talk about this uh, little approach of Jupiter and Venus that's continuing in our evening sky. A little video here of Snap to show from Stellarium. So all week long, watch the planetary lineup approach as mighty Jupiter and brilliant Venus head toward a beautiful conjunction happening on March the 2nd. Now, less than 10 degrees apart, or the width of your fist held out against the sky, they change position each night from our point of view. And after the conjunction, you can enjoy, continue to enjoy them as they switch positions and drift apart over the few following weeks. So there we go. Nice little show. And easy to pick out, you know, naked eye, uh, binoculars, you'll, you, uh, you'll get a, a better view of Venus and Jupiter both, but something that you can share with uh, the family and Always nice to have a celestial event like that. That's open to everybody and, and uh, going to expand itself over a few weeks now. So they're, they're closing in on each other, getting close to a, a close conjunction coming up on March the 2nd. Um, Monday night, uh, we have our new moon back. Our moon turns new tomorrow at 2 3.03 Atlantic, Atlantic time. Uh, the days around new moon are especially nice for astronomers and anyone who appreciates the night sky. These are the days when you can turn your gaze toward those fainter objects without being hampered by the light of a bright moon. Uh, it's when uh, those faint fuzzies stand out so well. We talk about the galaxies and star clusters and things that are a little tougher to pick out uh, with the uh, bright light of the moon around. So enjoy the, the night skies right around now. Uh, Monday evening though, uh, we have a young moon challenge coming up. Mike and I have tried this a number of times uh, we've caught it a number of times as well. Um, now, if the moon turns new in the morning, you can have a new moon challenge that e evening. Uh, with our moon turning new, it's, it's actually 3.05 Atlantic time. The objective is to try and catch a glimpse of it before it sets. Can't see much of a view right there. Very, very little uh, moon. Uh, but it's also, uh, it's always a bit, a bit difficult, but not impossible to achieve. But a 16-hour moon is very young and it's younger than most at sunset. If you give it a try, be sure that the sun has already set before uh, you start looking for sure, of course. So that's going to be a tr tricky one. I don't know whether the weather's going to cooperate or not tomorrow night, but it's always a, a neat one to go out and try with binoculars to see if you can catch it before the sun sets or before, uh, before it sets, just after the sun sets. Um, Tuesday, the moon and Venus. On Tuesday evening, look uh, for a thin crescent moon as it greets both Jupiter and Venus, forming a beautiful celestial trio there. Uh, the second, third, and the fourth brightest objects in the sky all lined up in a row for you to enjoy. It's a perfect photo operate there. 
waxing moon just at about 4% illuminated. Nice views uh, to the west after sunset uh, all this week. On Wednesday evening, the moon uh, meets Jupiter. Um, look for our crescent moon as it greets Jupiter. If you're watching the show with a telescope, you'll be able to witness the great red spot actually in perfect position at around 7.30 Atlantic time, along with the scattering of three of Jupiter's Galilean moons at the same time. So grab your binoculars or telescope out, enjoy the moon view and uh, swing it right over to Jupiter, very close by. On Sunday, uh, next Sunday, we're talking about the first quarter moon near the Pleiades and the Hyades. Um, the next Sunday evening, we'll offer a wonderful treat as our first quarter moon visits the beautiful Pleiades and Hyades star clusters. The Pleiades are the seven sisters is one of the bright of the brightest star clusters in the sky. It contains some 3000 stars and lies about 444 light years from Earth. Now, the Hyades is another open star cluster with more than a dozen colorful stars visible to the naked eye. It lies about 150 light years away and forms a familiar V shape uh, within the horns of Taurus the Bull. Now, although Aldebaran appears close by, it's actually much closer. Mars is nearby to help out round out the view as well. So nice view there uh, next Sunday evening. Of course, you won't be watching that because you'll be tuned into our show instead. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, nice views of the ISS passing over this week coming up too. Look at this. Nice uh, th minus 3.6, uh, minus 2.9. The lower the number, um, the brighter the object is. So minus 3.6, you're getting up to uh, the brightness of Venus right around that point. So uh, tomorrow evening, a nice big pass, minus 3.6. It's going up at altitude. Uh, you're going to see it around 18 degrees when it starts out. 69 degrees, almost overhead uh, at its highest point, and then settles out at 10 degrees on the, on the other horizon. So from southwest to east, northeast. Uh, 604 to 610, so about six minutes uh, pass across the sky. Um, and then the next night, Tuesday night, we have the same thing, only a little bit dimmer. Uh, again, on Wednesday and Thursday night, nice passes on Wednesday and Thursday night. I'm sorry, these are morning passes. These aren't evening passes. <laughs> sorry, yeah. 604 a.m. Yeah, so get got to get up early for these ones. 604 a.m., 518, uh, 604. So these are all morning passes this week. They were evening passes uh, the week before last, so. Anyway, it's still a nice treat to, to get out and enjoy for sure. If you haven't seen it before, uh, this is the kind of thing that you see going across the sky that says PM, it should be AM. Um, I had too many, <laughs> too many outreach events to set up today to get this right. <laughs> anyway, these are uh, AM uh, times, 6.05 to 6.12, so it does go right across the sky. They're always nice to, to watch and realize that uh, it's traveling across the Earth or around the Earth every uh, eight kilometers a, a second, every 90 minutes. Um, if you're looking for other events that are happening throughout the month, you can always go here to Lisa's Look Up Astronomy and More. Lisa's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Mastodon at Ruby Moonbeams. Um, these are the events that she lists every month. She puts out this calendar every month. These are the events for the month. These are the dates and times. And then we have uh, whether you need naked eye, binocular, or telescope to see those events. So she puts out that great calendar every month. I refer to it every time I get ready to do a What's Up talk. So thanks, Lisa. And of course, we have our February, March calendar here put out by Kurt Nason, uh, who does a great job on all the events that are happening throughout the month. And we're actually right up to six weeks. So um, this uh, calendar can be downloaded at sjastronomy.ca. And we're also members of the RASC NB as well. So you can get it on either site. Uh, a little bit of space news around the week. Uh, Aurora is detected on Jupiter's largest moons. Now, astronomers observing Jupiter's moons as they sat in the shadow of Jupiter have discovered new auroras over Jupiter's four largest moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Now, the new auroras reveal in great detail the composition of the thin atmospheres of these moons, including traces of oxygen and sodium, but only minimal water vapor. The four Galilean moons all possess oxygen auroras, the same as can be seen in the sky over Earth around our planet's poles. Yet because the gases on the Jovian moons are much thinner than they are on Earth, these auroras glow in deep red rather than the familiar green glow seen over Earth. How neat. Auroras in other worlds. Oh, the sun. The sun has been very active lately. Um, we are really winding up into our uh, peak of the solar cycle coming up soon. The sun, so the sun has released a massive 2.2 solar flare. That's one of the strongest uh, solar flares um, possible. 
Uh, massive solar flare erupted from the sun on Friday, February 17th, as the Earth was uh, under a geomagnetic storm watch from flares uh, earlier in the week. Now, the huge solar flare, which registered as a powerful X2.2 sunstorm, began at 3.38 p.m. Atlantic time and reached its peak strength 48 minutes later. From start to finish, the intense solar storm lasted one hour and 12 minutes and created a temporary radio blackout on the sunlit side of the Earth. The X2.2 solar flare followed a series of strong flares and a coronal mass ejection from the sun in recent days, including a strong X1.1 flare on February 11th. Follow a series of strong? Oh, it's got sound on. Um, the new flare also unleashed a coronal mass ejection, a massive eruption of solar plasma that can travel at 1.6 million kilometers per hour toward the Earth, according to spaceweather.com, which tracks the space weather. It should reach Earth on February 20th, where it may also supercharge Earth's auroras, uh, the sun is currently heading towards solar maximum, a time of increased activity in our star's 11-year cycle. So there may be aurora coming up on Monday evening, is what it's saying, because of this uh, solar flare and the uh, resultant CME that was released. Uh, we may just get a bl glancing blow, uh, but NASA is predicting a, a stronger one, so <clears throat> we'll have to wait and see. Um, ESA, uh, your European Space Agency, is building an early warning system for dangerous asteroids. Now, they're working on a new mission that would, could act as an early warning system for dangerous, hard-to-see asteroids called NEOMIR, the Near Earth Object Mission in the Infrared. The spacecraft would orbit between the Earth and the Sun at the L1 Lagrange point, finding space rocks that otherwise get lost in the glare of the Sun. Usually, astronomers can discover asteroids thanks to the light they reflect from the Sun, the proposed near mission would have the ability to find asteroids 20 meters and larger that can't be seen from the ground, ones that are heading towards Earth and coming from the direction of the sun. Now, these could be imminent, Im imminent impactors on a collision course with Earth. So the spacecraft would use a half meter telescope with a large corrected focal plane with the ability to see an infrared light in the five to 10 micrometer wave band. That's interesting. Nice to see that uh, come about, I think. And of course, amazing web back at it again. Astronomers have revealed the latest deep field image from NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, featuring never before seen details in a region of space known as Pandora's Cluster, or ABLE uh, 2744. Webb's views display three clusters of galaxies already massive coming together to form a mega cluster. The combined mass of the galaxy clusters creates a powerful gravitational lens, a natural magnification effect of gravity, allowing much more distant galaxies in the early universe to be observed by using the cluster like a magnifying glass. The new view of Pandora's cluster stretches four web snapshots together into one panoramic image displaying roughly 50,000 sources of near infrared light. Let's take a look at that one just a little bit closer. And I think I can do a little bit of a zoom here. Where is that zoom in? Here we are. We'll have a peek at this. So everything you see on that page, just about, is a galaxy. Wow. Pretty amazing, huh? I wonder if those galaxies have planets with balloons floating around their atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an incredible uh, amount of detail there for astronomers to go back and review, right? That's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's all galaxies. Look at that. Just endless. Yeah, I know. Unbelievable. Yeah, we're alone, you know. Yeah, it's just us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you can see the light bending uh, galaxies here cool. light coming from behind them. There's so much gravity that it's bending the light from galaxies from behind. So we're getting, you see the ones behind as well. What section of sky was that, Chris? That's an Abel 7, uh, 7 forward. 44, I believe. Just one sec for the back one. Able 2744, it's called. Wow, that's unbelievable. Pandora's cluster. Wow. Mm. And uh, that's about all for this week's What's Up. <laughs> <laughs> I know how he feels. <laughs> <laughs> Get the binoculars up. <laughs> <laughs>
that's good. <laughs> oh, wow, that's good. <laughs> okay. Mm. <laughs> uh, okay, and then from there, um, we got a, what do we got next? Final bud. Final bud's next. Final bud. Uh, I think it's on the screen. What we got this week, Mike? All right. Binocular target of the week this week. And you mentioned it tonight, Chris, and it's perfectly timed in the sky. Oh. It's Messier 45 or the Pleiades or <laughs> the Seven Sisters. <laughs> Hopefully we won't get copyrighted for that one. Yeah. <laughs> so commonly called Pleiades or the Seven Sisters, M45 <laughs> is known as an open star cluster. It contains uh, well over a thousand stars, like Chris had about 3,000, I believe that are loosely bound by gravity, but it's uh, visually dominating, uh, dominated by a handful of the brightest members. M45 is located an average distance of 445 light years from the Earth in the constellation Taurus, and has an apparent magnitude of 1.6 and can be seen with the naked eye. The cluster is best observed during January and February. It's perfectly placed in the sky. So this is what you're going to see, and that's why they call it the Seven Sisters, for the seven bright stars, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, even though you might point some other stars around it, those are the brightest. How do I find it in the sky? Well, tonight it just clouded over, but if you went out at 9 o'clock, oriented yourself 250 degrees west, southwest, and looked up, you will see Taurus and Mars, and you look just off to the side, and there's M45. You can't miss it. It uh, looks like the little dipper in the sky. So it's easy to spot. What will you see? Well, hopefully you see something like this. It'll, anyway, you'll see the main stars. You may not see the blue haze around it. You might see a little green haze around it. But when you photograph it, that blue haze comes out beautifully, and it's just an amazing sight. 10 by 50 binoculars, this is what your view would be, minus the blue, probably. You just see that in black and white or gray. So it's a good size. It takes up, you know, oh, uh, a good portion of 10 by 50 binoculars, well easy to see, and a beautiful sight. Compared to the full moon, easily, easily bigger than a full moon, if not two full moons. So it's a simple object to find, pretty big, gorgeous to look at. In fact, it's nicer to look at in binoculars on a telescope because you can see the whole thing. Yeah. And budget astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> or MacGyver. <laughs> Have you built one yet, Mike? I like the one sandal. <laughs> yeah. I like that too. Yeah. And the whole yeah. machine. Yeah, we got some cardboard tubes, a Coke can. <laughs> There's an iron, a frying pan, a couple of twist ties. I like it. <laughs> Even yeah. adjustable leg. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> and a pool cue. And a pool cue, yeah. <laughs> and one table leg. <laughs> so that's binocular target of the week. Awesome. Good stuff. Hey, everyone in the yeah. pool. <laughs> I remember using a cardboard tube at one time. Save, save, my, save my weekend for sure. Yeah, oh yes, that big old cardboard up in uh, Lake Livingston. Yep. Oh, yeah, for uh, the uh, new shield, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, uh, okay, how about the Rosanna's fun facts next? All right, we can do that. Uh, let me get my share. Oh, hang on one second. Did you, oh, Paul, you already answered all the questions on Facebook. Yep, yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I answered a bunch there. Great. Uh, okay, let's do that and share. And this is this week's Rosanna's Fun Fact. Yay. Yay. Welcome back, Rosanna, for another timely and fun fun fact from Rosanna. So let's get right into this. So Rosanna writes, hi, Paul. These have been lots. There has been lots of sky excitement over the past few weeks from the E3 ZTF comet to the Chinese spy balloon to the three unidentified objects just shot down by the US military. It was seen there was more than normal to look for. But as one journalist put it, the military is finding more objects because it is now actively looking for them. <laughs> See if you still find <laughs> or something like that. With all the attention going to EZ3, ZTF comet, I missed another comet, 96P, Mac Holtz, putting on a show. It's a bit of a peep show, as it is mostly hidden. Most likely, if you didn't catch it, 
in the fat in the last few days uh, of January or early early February, you won't catch it now. But at least 96P has a 5.29 year orbit, so there is always next time. Two interesting facts about this comet are that 96P has the shortest. Check here. I'm gonna find my. There we go. There it is. There has the shortest uh, perihelion distance of any known comet, and it exhibits a strange carbon and uh, uh, cyanogen depletion that suggests it may actually be a captured extrasolar comet. <clears throat> so this is comet 96P Macholes, as seen from Soho's LASCO C3 imager. And sadly, uh, with this, um, the sad detail I came across the screen while reading about this comet is that its discoverer, a prolific comet hunter, Don uh, Macholtz, passed away last year due to COVID. He was 69 and one of the last of an era of visual comet hunters. Don had actually discovered uh, 12 comets. That's a, that's a lot of comets. Don's comets, uh, Don's comet rather, reached uh, Perilion on January 31st at only 18.5 million kilometers from the sun. Now, that's three times closer to the sun than Mercury at its closest. The comet put on a fine show sliding through a field of view of the joint NASA ESA SOHO, the Solar and uh, Heliospheric Observatory, LASCO C3 imager. Now, SOHO's primary mission is to monitor solar activity, but it does but it does pick up sun gazing and even doom comets from time to time. Since 1995, and due mostly to the efforts of dedicated online volunteers, 4,500 comets have been actually 4,551 comets have been discovered. Prior to the launch of SOHO, less than a dozen sun gazing comets were known. It will be sad to see the amazing resource come to its scheduled end in 20. 25. Now here's a cool quick video. I'm going to see if I can get this video to run first before I uh, actually show Here it. Here at the Nissan Institute of Pyrology, we're looking at the cold. And there. Okay, so um, here's a cool quick video. Let me just put that on pause so I can do that. Uh, of Comet uh, 96P sun gazing flyby two weeks ago from Soho's view in the Solar and Terrestrial Relations Observatory. And I'm just going to slide that over here and let everybody have a peek at that. I'll make it so number one and make it large so you can see all you can see. And let's just play it. I'll turn sound back up just in case you're sounding. So that's very cool. So um, there is still a sliver of hope that we may get to see this comet. The comet seems to have retained some of its brightness. Let me just get on the next picture here so you can see that. There we go. Some of its brightness. Um, astrophotographer Michael Jagger managed to nab the comet early in the morning on February the 5th from Martinsburg, Austria. And he says that the comet was just 15 degrees west of the sun, sporting a one degree long tail, about twice the diameter of the full moon. Now, although the low, although low to the horizon targets are always difficult, let's turn that back up, there we go, um, <clears throat> are always difficult, the comet was holding steady at a magnitude zero, now according to the universe today, which made it about as bright as the star Vega. However, like uh, extended deep sky objects, that, that precious magnitude gets smeared out 
over surface area, making the comet look visually fainter. For today, though, the Sky Live site states that 96P is at 11.38 magnitude, heavens above said 8.8, .8, and Skyhound suggested 9.8. So regardless, you will need a telescope to see it. It will stay 10 to 15 degrees above the horizon for most of February. When clouds retreat, they always uh, there's always something to discover in the night sky. This is kind of cool. <clears throat> Including this drone display, which although beautiful, is an astronomer's nightmare and could be relabeled target practice for the U.S. military. <laughs> <laughs> or the St. John Astronomy Club. <laughs> <laughs> more and more quick uh, glance is not enough to figure out why some night nice sky surprises are uh, what they actually are. You idiot, you're howling at the Chinese spy <laughs> <laughs> And that is this week's... <laughs> Rosetta's Fun Fact. Yay! Oh, man. Thank you so much, Rosetta. Another That's awesome. Awesome, awesome mm, fun fact. Wow. What a great view of the comment, though, eh? Yeah. yeah. I mean, wow. all over the place. Yeah. And, and most of the public only see what is in the news about comets, but there's mm -hmm. comets all the time. Yeah, sun grazers all the time that are going in, flying into the into the sun. Yeah, finding that many comets with that one spacecraft, eh? Yeah, amazing. That one is low to the horizon too, and you got to catch it within like an hour, less than an hour of the sunrise. Yeah, is the time yeah. you got. So, yeah, 20 degrees isn't that 15 or 20 degrees is not that high in the sky, especially no. if you're not on a if you're not on the ocean. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah Larry, I'm showing at a magnitude eight. So yeah, 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 it's pretty dim. Yeah, yeah, we're we're due for a good comet, guys. We really are. It's time. Yeah, we need one. Not 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 one that'll hit us, but we need one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's go from there to um, photos. 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 Yeah, I just need a second here to get my notes up. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I think we can start. To... Picture this. <laughs> yeah. Say, we got to get some music in, in between our segments or something. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Yeah, something real sublime or something. Else. And the sound of silence. And they're all opening up very big too, so I have to minimize them as they come up. Anyway, let's go to here. I'll bring the guitar and I'll just play. I'll send it. Send there it. you go. <laughs> Rob, good. Hey, our comet. Hey, yeah, hey, there's a uh, comet <laughs> from David David Smard, um, February the twelfth. Uh, right on, Dave. Nice. Uh, ISO 3200 camera uh, T3I, uh, an eight inch SCT. Nice capture. There you yes, go. And there's another one that he's captured here as well. Good stuff, David. Yeah, good nice job. Time. Our last view is probably of it for a while. Now, these are all enlarging too big. Anyway, and here he's got his uh, M42. Oh, yes. M42, there it is. That's and color. And uh, SCT 8 inch, uh, 14 seconds, 50 millimeter, 1600 ISO. Nice. Yes, sir. In this second capture here of it as well. Oh, yeah. All right. Now you're cooking with well. propane. There's a big trapeze in right <laughs> the center of that thing, eh? Mm. Yeah. Nicely done. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go from there to some uh, planet shots because I know people were talking about Jupiter and Venus, and uh, I've been talking about it, I guess, too. So, an owl. Jupiter, Venus, <laughs> and an owl. That's awesome. I've never heard of the owl planet, but anyway. Well, who gives He's owling it? at the planets. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoying the show, right? So, well, I'll be there. That's, that's Roxanne. Thank you, Roxanne. <laughs> <laughs> nice capture. Nice, yeah. Another one here from, uh, this one's come from Casey Hashi. She said, I captured it also. She said, beautiful. Yes, sir. Yes. They're getting closer. They are. Very much so. And there's another nice shot here from uh, Bridget Smith. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, thanks Perfect. to your post, she said, I went out and they were uh, very bright. And they are getting brighter. Or not brighter. Yeah. Not getting brighter, but they are very bright when uh, when you oh, get that gosh. nice contrast in the sky. First thing yeah. you see at night. 
Um, and Shannon, Shannon Rose Ryan, this one here, another Sweet. capture. Nice. So getting lots of them. So we'll be, we'll be getting a whole lot more, I hope, in the next couple of weeks anyway. Make sure you send your photos in. We love getting them. Um, Kathy Adams. Kathy Shaw, yeah. Very yeah, nice. so she said that. So I tried to, I decided to try my camera on my AZ GDE mount and shoot Orion. The skies here are semi cloudy, but I wanted to see what the mount would be like using its point and track on a DSO. Uh, polar aligning is not possible here, and I was pleased with the mount. No star trails up to 45 seconds, and if the clouds had held off, I could have tried 60 seconds. Wow. This image was only 15 seconds with the ISO 200, as anything more really showed the clouds. That's pretty good for ISO 200. Yeah, yeah really. Uh, fun little mount, she said, for sure. Maybe we'll get a clear sky and try it again sometime. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Clear sky. Well done, though, Kathy. Thanks. Yeah, you can see the running man there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris uh, Ben was beautiful ben sunshot. Was. Look at that, eh? Those sunspots, huh? He had a video of that when he was shooting at man. Was she ever dancing around? So that's impressive what he got. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The video. Really well done. Well done. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, David Hoskins here's uh, M44, Messier 44 image last night. He said from Halifax, this open star cluster co uh, located in the constellation of Cancer is also known as the Beehive Cluster or yes, Persephone, uh, which is Latin for crib. The cluster contains about 1,000 gravitationally bound stars. Really nice. Uh, nice colors. He's using nice colors, a, eh? a reflector, I guess. Reflector, for, yeah. Mm. I love nice effect. Diffraction spikes. Like yeah. yeah, really nice. Okay. Nice effect. Well done, David. I'm uh, going to go here to Robert Gadets. Yes, sir. Yeah, he's been getting some nice shots. Man, he's getting some nice shots. This is just yeah. incredible. I'm doing really well. Yeah, yep. I really love these. These are really good. It's yep. almost like a system. It's right there to reach out and touch. Although you wouldn't want to feel it open like an orange. Yeah. <laughs> sure is. Yeah. Amazing. Beautiful capture, Robert. Beautiful shot. Great shots on that. And uh, go from there to uh, this one here is from Brad Perry. Yes, right, so there's a capture of the comet and Mars uh, from last night. This is February 11th. This is a while back. This is 107, 45 second light frames and 40 dark frames at 300 millimeter. Nice. <clears throat> nice wow. capture. Nice. That's one to keep for sure. Yeah, it's a keeper. And then well, you got this one here. <laughs> I, I, I hate this guy because he does this. <laughs> oh, I know. Nobody else, when nobody else gets a roar, he's got these shots. Eh? Where's he at? He's up around Edmonston? Uh, no, he's just outside of Durham Bridge, I believe. He's just up around there. Really? How the heck? Is he he said, uh, just sharing this photo I got of the Aurora on the night of February 14th. The KP index was only hovering at three at the time of this photo, so it was very faint to the naked eye. But of course, the camera always helps reveal what's really going on. Yeah. It's fingers That's crossed for that potential KP6 on Friday, which we didn't get, of course, but well, the local weather isn't looking promising anyway. Um, happy to share the equipment and settings. The, the camera is a Sony A6000 and this lens is a Sigma 16 millimeter. Uh, the settings were F1.4, eight seconds, ISO 1600. Uh, it's just a single shot and the Aurora moves around too much for any stacking or any of that stuff. But I love the fact that he puts himself in the shot there. That's really cool. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a gorgeous shot. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's some nice uh, nice contract or Imagine context. If, yeah, even if you didn't see a lot of that aurora just standing there looking at the stars like that. Mm. Yeah, really. What a great yeah. horizon, eh? Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, try hitting number nine on your keyboard, Chris, to reset pictures to fit screen. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> just saw your comment there. Uh, let me try this. Okay, we'll try it here. Uh, we got one for Mike. Yeah. Let me see, hit nine. There you go. Hey, look at that. It does work. Thanks. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Woo! Should have that earlier. Uh, yeah, Mr. Got that one this afternoon. Yeah, today's sun. I hadn't opened the roof in a while, and I thought, geez, a nice sunny day. I'm going to see if I get her. That's, yes, sir. That's it. You did. Uh, just some good detail there, Mike. Yeah. Beauty. There and there's another. That's for the mono lovers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the penumbra and the umbra. Go back there from the sunspots. Can you zoom in on that? Yeah. Look at that large one there. Look at that. Yeah. Detail. Yeah, and the, all I like the, the all the facula. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, you captured everything really, really nicely. Yeah. Well then. Yep. Nice big one here. Oh, lots of activity. That's the one there that's generated the uh, X class players right there. So that looks it's like just, an alien, eh? You see the two yeah. eyes in it? Yeah, two eyes. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Let's hope it's not too much of an alien. Jasper, <laughs> the friendly sunspot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we got this one, Mike. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I said, don't try this at home. It was just a shot taken through the clouds, no filter. <laughs> hey, but you got you got the sunspots too. Got so the sunspots. That's, right that's, a, that's what surprised me. I got them. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's how big they are. <laughs> Mr. Owen. Oh. Nice. Yeah. Yes, it's a work in progress, I think. I can't wait to see when you get the rest of them done. Yeah. yeah. Like I was saying earlier, I, I went, got the green last night, but it uh, my camera malfunctioned, so I'll have to go at that again. It's just been so cloudy, it's just hard to get anything. Yeah, really. Yeah. So, but uh, but that's the hydrogen alpha stuff, and that's uh, that's coming along nicely. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Really nice. Lots of detail there. Great. Well, that's incredible detail in there. I love that flame. Yep. Yeah. You know what I noticed about that image and I never noticed before? If you look where the horse head is and keep going up that ridge to the to the left, uh, I can't, yep. Yeah, yeah, and follow that ridge down towards the flame nebula. Yeah. Well, I, I always thought that the horse head and the flame were a flat two dimensional thing. But if you look at that, that whole cloud uh, is a cloud that's in front of the flame. flame. Yeah. If you look down just a little bit lower, scan down now. You can see how that whole cloud rolls into the flame. So yeah. I had never seen the dimension of that uh, before until I started studying this. It's like, oh my goodness, this is not like a two-dimensional. Here's the horse. Here's the flame. Right. The yeah. It is completely in front of the flame. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, I thought, and this is one of the reasons why I got into this was that you could actually kind of study this stuff. And and here I am, amazed. I've shot this a million times, but I never saw. Um, I never saw it like, like, like this, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's the portion is amazing too. Yeah. Great job, Paul. That's the uh, best part. Something new every time, right? Well, <laughs> and then that's it. You shoot it, you shoot it each time. And it's like, oh my gosh, I never noticed that. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Awesome. I can't wait for the uh, the uh, the final for the, for the finale on it. Yeah, let's let's hope. <laughs> now there's the best shot of them all right there. There, there it is, there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, the three so. amigos right there. <laughs> all we need is uh, Mexican hats, eh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you have photos, we'd love to get them. As, as you can see, we love showing them too. Love showing them off your work. So send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. I'm trying to get everything to go there if I can. That way, I don't miss any. So. Uh, we love getting your photos. We'd love to share them next week. So drop them in, especially some photos of Jupiter and Venus here as they get closer. So send those in especially. Okay. And I'll close all the other windows here. And I think uh, all we get left is uh, a little bit of closing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, before we close out tonight, oh, hang on a second. What happened there? I lost my mouse. <laughs> it's to be on one of my 10 screens. <laughs> want some cheese? I'll give you some cheese there. You can get your mouse back. You what? I'll give you some cheese. Cheese, yeah. Well, I did lose my get mouse. Get your mouse back. <laughs> my uh, I just got that one. That's... <laughs> well, where'd it go? Goodness gracious. Tough crap. There it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's bring this over here. Now we're ready to go. Close it. The photo. There. Okay. So before we close out tonight, <laughs> I want to mention our talk for next week. Um, we've been discussing, uh, there's something that we haven't talked about in quite a while, and there's been a lot of activity on it lately, has been the sun. Um, we've seen a lot of sunspots, solar flares happening. There's been a lot of aurora, talk about aurora at least, uh, these X2.2 solar flares that have popped up over the last few days. So I think it's time that we go back and talk a little bit about our, our, uh, our star. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about solar flares, what they are, sunspots, uh, some activity that's happening on the sun, maybe a bit about uh, how to safely view the sun, if you want to take a look at the sun uh, and that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll be talking about the sun next week. Okay, so then in closing tonight, uh, thanks again for all of your support. Our special thanks, of course, to Rosanna for her continued contributions to the program. Rosanna, always awesome talks. Thank you very much. Really do appreciate it. We hope all of you who have enjoyed uh, joined us too from Rogers enjoyed the program tonight. Now, if you'd like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can find me at astronomybythebay.ca. Uh, remember too, we do love getting your photos. So send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com and we'd be happy to include them on our next broadcast. Um, and please let your friends and family know as well that we, we, we will be back here next week, uh, next Sunday night at 8 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook to entertain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. So for now then, from Mike and Paul and myself, we wish you a safe and happy week, everybody. Lots of clear skies. 
And as we like to say, guys, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes pointed up. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.